Hi and welcome back to Zootopia, we we acknowledge as far my name is Ava Robertson, I'm here to empower you through knowledge and motivation and I'm not a fuzzer. Let's get to learning. And in today's video, everything we are learning is taken directly out of this book, An Act of Repairs by Konstantin Stanislavski, which is a very interesting book, both in content and form. So to begin, what is An Act of Repairs? An Act of Repairs is a book where the goal is to teach you about acting, but the form is actually some sort Sort of like interesting self insert where we follow a young actor in his first year of acting school named Kostya which is basically Constantine so it's basically him but it's not him and his training in the school is within the Stanislavski system which is what we learn throughout this book Obviously, he writes in the perspective of the student, but with the teachings of the teacher, who he here has named Tortsov, it just makes the whole book more dynamic, obviously, and more engaging as well. Also, because he kind of puts drama, there are also other students there, and some of them are or are not romantically involved, and they all have strengths and flaws, and it's just, it reads like a story. The book and the goal of the Stanislavski system is both mastering the craft of acting and sort of realizing and learning that mastering the craft of acting is mastering your subconscious. So you have to continuously inspire your own subconscious through creativeness and imagination. Basically, every performance we see both on stage and on screen is heavily influenced by the Stanislavski system. So what I'm going to do in this video is basically go chapter through chapter, look at the biggest takeaways, and then at the end, I'm going to give my review. Let's go. Chapter one, the first test. Here, he and the other characters that he has named have to put on a show and they choose Othello. What the hell's Othello? It's really funny because this book was written in the 1800s so obviously he like lays it on thick with the black face and the imitation of an African man which he is chastised by his teacher for actually because Othello isn't African he's um, like a black British guy basically you know. This just starts the uh, book because it just shows us the personality traits of the students along with their strengths in acting and their weaknesses. And for Kostya, his strength is that he is an imaginative person and sometimes unintentionally is very good at acting, but his weaknesses is that he overacts and forces his acting. Chapter two, when acting is an art. Chapter two is where we actually start like really learning. And this is where we learn sort of the basis for the system, which is that to be a good actor, you have to use your subconscious, but you can't just directly say like, hey, subconscious work now. If you do, you sort of ruin what is subconscious because it will become conscious. So instead we have to have all these conscious methods to reach our subconscious and make us, uh, and make it do what we want it to do. And these methods is what the book is built up by. Built up by? built up of, I guess. And here we also get one of the biggest truths of the system by the quote, you may play well or you may play badly. The important thing is that you should play true. And then it goes on, to play truly means to be right, logical, and coherent. To think, feel, and strive in unison with your role. He must fit his own human qualities to the life of this person and pour onto it all of his own soul. You have to put a real humanness to each role and the only human and the only soul that you kind of have is your own so you have to relate that to the character. And then it says you must live it by actually experiencing feelings that are <laughs> analogous to it each and every time you repeat the process of creating it. And we'll see more of that going on, but that is a huge thing too, that each time you act, you have to relive it. Basically, forced acting, acting inauthentically is very frowned upon. And that is what Costa was doing with Othello because he wasn't thinking about what would I do in this situation? He was just imitating what he thought an African man was like, which for him is very like a savage. He was imitating a savage whilst that's not who Othello is at all. He didn't really look through the layers or try to identify with the character. He just wanted to make a big spectacle and have people give a reaction and that is forced acting and that's embarrassing. <laughs> but there are a thousand other mistakes he can make and one of those mistakes is getting too used to acting in front of a mirror because 
like I said, you have to relive it every time. You can't just relive it a couple of times and then imitate what you're doing. And that's what this one character Paul does. And Paul is kind of a great actor and he's kind of technically better than Kostya, but he has less soul than Kostya. And Tortsov basically shades Paul because it's like, Paul, I don't believe you're act we're acting authentically. I believe that what you did was you looked in the mirror, you tried to feel all the feelings and you saw, okay, what is happening in my face here? What's happening in my body there? And then you just imitated it. And he was like, no, no, I felt it every time. And he was like, stop lying, Paul. And he was like, oh, okay, you're fine. I, I, I didn't feel it every time. And he's like, ha, huh, you have to feel it, Paul. And he does say that this fault is harder to get rid of because being, like I said, Paul is kind of a great actor. Like being a mechanical actor takes so much hard work and precision and dedication that it's a lot harder to get rid of than Costia's mistakes, which were more just embarrassing and silly. So after pointing out their mistakes, he says that what she should do is actually study the person, get to know them, and then live with them. This is about the thrill of wearing another man's skin. And he says this, you should first of all assimilate the model. This is complicated. You study it from the point of view of the epoch, the time, the country, the condition of life, background, literature, psychology, the soul, way of living, social position, and external appearance. Moreover, you study characters such as custom, manner, movements, voice speech and notations all this work and your material will help you permeate it with your own feelings without all of this you will have no art and then he says which i'm also going to read because honestly i love it art is not real life not is it even its reflection art is in itself a creator it creates its own life beautiful and abstraction beyond the limits of time and space Hang that on my fridge. He goes on to say that we have to get away from cliches. And he says that every moment that isn't filled with real acting will be taken up by a cliche. And now this was written in the 1800s. So the cliche are like opening your mouth when you're dying or like fainting like this or crying like this, which we see a lot still, especially in shows. Because I am a failure at everything and my breath smells like fly. <laughs> And I think like this is a lot because it's hard to cry on command and it's easier to sort of be like, you know, pretending like you're crying. But in modern, like modern, modern things, I guess it would be like, I don't know, like widely opening your mouth in shock and yelling to make things funny. Well, I guess. One thing I actually like about modern societies, and I'm trying to think of several of these cliches, I can see that a lot of them are now used in an ironic way by characters like, oh wow, that hurt, you know, like that thing I love. I guess one thing would be like if I were drinking this and someone said something shocking to me and I was like, do I choke on drinks yes but rather when i'm laughing no when people say something surprising to me i'm like walking around people are like yeah she got pregnant i was like <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous and this also goes back to overacting because you know a lot of times if you're not actually feeling something you're sort of thinking okay what does a person who's feeling this thing act like and it's easier to resolve to cliches and overacting in the same way as forced acting is embarrassing Torts all just is embarrassed for you and so you gotta stop. But, you know, we gotta also remember that, uh, first of all, screen acting and stage acting are kind of different and comedic acting and dramatic acting are really different and a lot of the humor from comedic acting comes from, like I said, like using a cliche or from it being over the top. Although, like I also said, my number one, like, stop it with comedic acting is when you're using yelling instead of a joke. However, a lot of time absurdity is the point. But then I'd say go into the absurd mindset. Like for example, one of my favorite shows, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, has a lot of overdramatic moments, but because of the way the characters are written, although it would be very, very over the top for a normal person, it actually fits the character. Like, I'm sure we all know, Dennis Reynolds like I am untethered and my rage knows no bounds like for a normal person screaming I am a golden god be like okay bro but for him it's actually what he's feeling and therefore it is true and here with the overacting like I said he's like okay Costia first of all you reduce your role to stereotype that's bad secondly you were just trying to impress the audience that's even worse 
And thirdly, you didn't use your own emotions, so you weren't even acting. Chapter three, action. Chapter three, action is very fascinating. It starts with him making each and every one of the actors sit on stage. Just sit. So why is it so hard and awkward? What, like it's hard? Personally, I get it. It's like when I'm like when I'm studying just by myself, I'm like doing whatever, I'm moving my body, however feels good, chilling, you know, just studying. But when I'm studying on stream, especially the more people come in, I'm like getting like weird and fidgety and like checking my hair, maybe my hair should be like this, you know, like glasses on, glasses off. I'm so conscious about how much I'm marking out. Like, oh, I haven't marked anything in a while. What if people think I'm faking? Or like, I'm marking too much. This must seem weird. Like, do I think everything's important? Thinking about the dumbest things and just so conscious about being perceived. And that is what all of the students do. They all go on the stage and they're like fidgeting and just everyone's laughing at them because they are they just seem embarrassing. And then Tortsov takes the stage, the teacher, and he just goes there, he sits, he's like majestic AF. He's like, <sighs> and they're all like, what is he thinking about? What's going on inside his mind? Wow. Like, I really want to know what's happening to this person or this character in their head it like looks like it's really just being amazing and he explains that it's because everything that happens on stage must have a purpose not a physical purpose like sitting but a spiritual purpose why are you sitting he says do not act in general act with purpose and then he further proves his point by having Maria, I think that's the girl that's like mostly pretty, looking for a brooch. Like he hangs a brooch or he says he hangs a brooch on the, the, you know, the carpet, the thing, the curtain that comes down on the stage. And she's like very dramatically like, oh, where is it? Like there's a backstory, but that doesn't matter for our discussion right now. But she's being very dramatic about it and everyone's like, okay. But she's like, oh my God, I killed it. And he's like... <laughs> where's the brooch and she, she's like oh i forgot about like actually finding the brooch and he's like mm -hmm. and then the second time she's like very methodically like looking up and down and he asks he asks her like which was better and she was like the first time obviously it was like drama and he's like no the second time is better because you were actually looking and everyone agrees and that's the lesson like the purpose drives the acting not vice versa can't just act as if something is happening and nothing's happening, you know? Do not act in general, act with purpose. I think that's a very good and concise thing to remember, actually, is I like that quote. And then a thing that goes throughout this too is uh, an example that he does with all of them, so much so that they get sick of this entire scene. It starts with him asking one of the guys, like, hey, can you close the door? And he's like, just like, oh, okay, whatever. And then he's like, oh, it won't actually close. And he's like, it'll close but you have to actually try to close it. And he's like, I did. He's like, you didn't. And then when he goes like very methodically, he can close the door. And then the reason he's closing the door the second time is because he's like, what if there was a madman who escaped who used to live here who's now behind the door? And just saying that, like, what if, makes all of them like jump into action and they're all like acting like they really are in a horror movie. Wanna play psycho killer? He actually closes the door and people are getting weapons like everything's very like as it should be because as he says all action in the theater must have an inner justification be logical coherent and real in theater real and real real is obviously very different but basically theater real it has to be sort of real for you and you have to be in the character you have to experience the emotions even if you logically know that it isn't actually happening. And here we are introduced to what I think is one of the most brilliant parts of the entire book and I think personally it should have the chapter name and that's the concept of if. Like I said, he was like, what would you do if there was madman there? Not like, imagine there's madman there, but like, what would you do if that happened, you know? So how I would write it out is like, don't think, imagine that you're a Barbie in Barbie land and your feet turn flat, but think, what if you were a Barbie in Barbie land and your feet turned flat? What if you invented the atomic bomb? What if I got bit by a spider and got superpowers? With great power comes great responsibility. The what if just makes you think, you know, sometimes you'll hang around and just think like, what if mermaids are real? What if there are actually aliens on the planet right now? Not, 
imaginator in a world with aliens that's kind of like okay bro whatever but just like what if you were it just makes you think in a different way it's more casual there are no commitments it's just an interesting thought experiment chapter four imagination this is a continuation of the what ifs and the whole lesson here is basically that everything that happens on stage is or should be a result of our own imagination, putting ourselves in elaborate what ifs that align with the character. Chapter five, concentration of attention. Basically, this is like deeply concentrating on people or objects like really concentrating and seeing and not like looking into the audience and basically if you're if you have to look into the audience like if you're looking over the ocean you're not looking at the audience you are looking at the ocean you know mom what's up john what and i think this is a lot what it comes down to when we are watching a movie and we feel like the actors don't have chemistry i think it's because they're not seeing each other not having that concentration of attention that you're supposed to have where you sort of look at something like deeply like i think for youtubers too when you're looking at the green dot you're not supposed to actually see the green dot you're looking at the green dot but you're seeing the people you're talking to you're seeing your audience in a very abstract metaphorical way but whatever you're seeing it's not what's actually in front of you it's what you're supposed to see and that's like one of the big things you have to learn when you first start making videos and that's the same with acting like i've actually struggled with this like obviously when i'm acting i'm looking at my co-stars but a lot of time i must admit i sort of fail and like even though i'm looking in their eyes i'm thinking about my lines and when you're thinking about your lines you're not really connecting with a person in the right way. Another thing here is like, not like looking for the brooch, but let's say she was looking at the brooch. You're supposed to like really look at the brooch, right? Like the brooch means something to you, not like, say this is the brooch. Not looking at the brooch and like trying to remember my lines, but actually like looking at the brooch and seeing my lines and the lines are making sense because Oh my god, I actually found the brooch. And again, that's the awkwardness I was talking about, like sitting on stage. He goes back, he says that basically when you're an actor, you're a baby. You have to learn everything again. You have to learn talking, looking, sitting down, walking, all of these things you have to relearn for the stage because we frankly lose our physical abilities to do things normally when we know people are looking i'm sure you know this when you're like typing on your laptop someone looks over your shoulder and suddenly you're just making mistakes you're like fuck dude or like me when i went to live in dallas for a couple months and i literally spoke the worst english i have in my life that was fun just been speaking the language since i was like what what <laughs> and i think that um even more so than walking and sitting it's actually just listening and seeing you know actually using our senses in somewhat of a natural way and when he's talking about seeing an object he says you shouldn't just be like looking at it you should be fascinated about it you should want to use it like if um like if this pen is a pen it shouldn't just be like oh no, it's a pretty nice pen it should be like i kind of want like use this pen like right now like wow i get it cute you leave this pen here and people are supposed to think wait that looks like a dick you know, that's how you should feel. Harry also introduces a concept of like drawing an imaginative circle around you and whatever is in the circle is what you're paying attention to. Whatever is outside of the circle doesn't really exist and you pull the circle around with you and you can practice this in everyday life too where you're paying attention and matching the circle so, so big and then just like bringing the circle around. So when you walk, it's not like you're leaving your circle, it's always around you. And a lot of that is obviously to um, to not pay attention to like the the audience, the audience and stuff, but it's also to actually really do pay attention to things around you and to live in the world you're supposed to live in. And it makes sense, you know, like for example, if I'm sitting here studying, I have my computer, my glasses, all of these markers, these pens, these lip gloss, and I'm not really paying attention, except for a couple of like looks, I'm not really paying attention to this random hallway or that picture over there or this window. It doesn't really matter to me. If it really did, then it would be in my study streams and stuff, but it's not, you know. 
and like for the purpose of this video what's behind the camera doesn't actually matter to me at all and it's not in my circle of attention because I'm, I'm really not paying attention to it and so that being the case in everyday life it should also be the case on stage or on screen and this is how you find solitude on stage or in public as you probably know, an actor is naturally curious, but uh, Tortsov also says that an actor should be observant not only on stage but also in real life. He should concentrate with always being in whatever attracts his attention. He should look at an object not as an absent-minded passerby but with penetration. So jot that down. Chapter 6, Relaxation of Muscles. This is actually so important in the book that I confused it with being a lot earlier in the book in my memory. Maybe also because I so desperately need to master it. Tortsov says as long as you have this physical tenseness you cannot even begin to think about the delicate shadings of the spiritual life of your part. And according to him, it should be worked on daily, both at school and at home. And basically how you work on it is that you like are po in any pose, like this that I'm in now, for example, and you sort of feel throughout your entire body and you try to locate any tenseness. And if it's not necessary for the pose, like obviously when I'm sitting like this, I have to be tense in my lower back, but I'm a little bit tense in my shoulder, for example, and that shouldn't be there. So to relax those tensenesses that you're not supposed to have is sort of the challenge. And no matter how relaxed you think you are in your pose, you're definitely not relaxed enough. We can't get to that point. And he talks a lot about an experiment where like if you lay a baby or a cat in sand, you can see their entire print there. But like if a human lays there, you won't see like, like between, you know, my back, like the between the the shoulder blades and stuff because we always tense up we're never like relaxed enough to have our entire body imprint in the sand so relax as much tenseness as you can you'll still never be a cat harry also points out that like whatever weirdness is going on in your posture will be a thousand times weirder on stage he says if these stiff arms are halfway passable in real life on stage, they are simply intolerable. Chapter 7, Units and Objectives. Probably my least favorite chapter, if I'm being entirely honest, but maybe I just don't get it. <laughs> Let's say you're shooting a movie. This makes sense. This is how a script is. Let's say you're shooting a movie. Obviously, you gotta cut it up into scenes. But then in scenes, we have all these different little things happening. You have to cut up those as well. Whether we're just following one actor or several actors, we still have to cut it up. And that's not just for the director or for the writers, whoever, but also for the actors so that they can actually do each part well, I guess. Everything should flow, but we should also cut it up. And he says, cut it up into small enough units that every part is interesting to you. It shouldn't be long enough that you lose interest. Each one of these units that you cut up needs an objective, and that objective should be ironically enough, um, says as a verb because that is more like action oriented. For example, let's take the scene in Suicide Squad where Harley Quinn is trying to convince Enchantress that she is convinced by her so that she can actually like save the gang. I like what you're selling, lady. This is obviously a very specific unit. Like the unit is that little piece of dialogue where she says, I like what you're selling, lady, and a little bit blah blah blah, and everyone's just looking at her, no one else is talking, and what she wants, obviously, is like to conquer her, win, blah blah blah, but instead of putting it merely as like tricking the goddess, which is kind of like, okay, that is what she's doing, you need to have as much, not just verb, but as much action and feeling behind it as possible. So a better thing would be, for example, I wish to do good no matter what it costs me now or in the future. Because the, the whole scene is her tricking the goddess. Well, what, what really is she doing? Why is she doing it? What does she wish? What does she will? A very big part of this is I wish, I will, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know if I explained that well enough, but I don't know if I know it well enough. You put it into pieces and then you give some verbs behind those pieces and some wish and some wants and some wills and moving on. Chapter eight, faith and a sense of truth. And Tortsov says, truth on the stage is whatever we can believe in with sincerity, whether in ourselves or in our colleagues. 
Truth cannot be separated from belief, nor belief from truth. They cannot exist without each other, and without both of them, it is impossible to live your part or to create anything. That's sort of what I've been trying to say, but here you got it a lot more precisely put. So to obtain this level of truth, we basically have to keep taps on ourselves and criticize ourselves when we're not acting truthfully, which I think a lot of us do in everyday life. A lot of us sort of put on a show for other people. Like I was watching um, Sad Boys with Jarvis Johnson and Jordan Adika, and they were talking about how a lot of time when you like stumble in public, you kind of like whoop, you know, like you do a little like, ah, oh, that's so weird that I would stumble. My options were limited like why but we do it so much that like they they were saying that they even sort of do it at home there are so many behaviors that we do that like when we do them in private we're sometimes like wait why did i do that it gets ingrained in us to act for a public audience so much so that we even do it when there is no audience and when we're doing that you know we're not acting truthfully we're acting for the audience, which you should never do, you act with the audience, the audience gives you feedback, but when you're acting, you should always act based on the inner truth, and that goes for like acting in everyday life too, which is why watching yourself in everyday life will make you a better actor. And here again, fuck cliches and hail logic. There's this scene they do a lot where, I'm not gonna go over the whole scene, but basically uh, someone burns some money, and Tortsov is like, don't stand there and act shocked shocked like that's what we want to do but money burns quickly so you gotta get in there and try to get at the money before you can react you can react after kind of you just you spring to action in i remember like i um, i accidentally set fire to pizza box that was laying on an oven when i was younger and i guess in the movie maybe i'd be like oh and then but i was just like oh but like the reaction sort of comes with the action if there is any reaction at all to begin with. I can't remember what I did with my face, but I do remember that the first thing I did was like get the pizza box and get it under running water. I didn't stand there for like a good second to get a reaction shot, you know? So we have to really, really analyze what is natural and what is logical to get the right reaction and not just think about the emotions, but think about what are the circumstances. And what actually makes sense and to do that we also have to kind of like make sense in our life and i think a lot of this also comes down to space work like okay let me get an empty can shouldn't be that hard in this room oh look you already got one okay empty can full can already you can see the difference that i'm even trying that in like how I'm lifting it up and this is something that happens in movies a lot if you're pretending to drink beer or something and they don't put water in the cup you get like because it's so much lighter it's hard like it, it takes a lot of effort to actually lift the can naturally i almost have to like compare it to see okay what is the speed you know it's easy to just be like oh Oh, I was walking and I blah blah, you know, whilst with this, it, it doesn't come as easy. So really, really thinking about like, okay, not only is this a can, but it's a full can. How does one actually lift a full can? Have to mouth and drink. Space work. A lot of this is space work and a lot of this is obviously harder than to because stage acting and screen acting are also completely different and then budgets and then CGI I think is ruining a lot of things and whatever. And then we take a return to units and objectives here where he says like if you don't believe what is happening then you have to break it into smaller units until whatever is happening seems believable to you. He also gives a pretty strong method acting advice here where it's like if you can't act like your character off stage, then at least think like your character and don't think any thought that they wouldn't think. This tip makes a lot of sense because we're not just supposed to embody the character as in, in the body, in the physical, but also the soul. And the body and soul are very connected and something that goes a lot on. So obviously if we lose the soul connection, we lose the body connection. Then obviously don't 
focus merely on the action you're doing or the emotion you're portraying, but mostly on the character, everything you know about the character and then the situation. Then whatever emotion comes from that should come after and not before. And no naturalism for naturalism's sake. Naturalism for naturalism's sake is also overacting. And if you don't know, naturalism is basically like gross things. So like in the oversaturated death, for example, like the root of naturalism is an offshoot of realism that was really focused on the lower class. And there's a lot of like death and decay and like flies surrounded the body or whatever. Like even in comedy as well, things should have a meaning below just being oversaturated and funny. And if not, it's not really that funny. And to avoid naturalism, draw from your own emotions. That's why you should also be in contact with your own emotions so that the emotions you're feeling and most importantly, obviously portraying make sense. So do not act based on what you think would be cool or what the audience would react to, but basically what seems natural. In contrast with naturalism, he talks about a dead baby scene that is portrayed by a young actress in the group. Uh, one of the students who has probably experienced the loss of a baby based on the rumors. Obviously we can't deny whether or not this is true because she's not real. But in response to her perfect portrayal of the scene, he says, she took nothing for wholesale. She took just what was necessary, no more, no less. And then he goes on to say that it's very difficult because it's so much easier to lie on stage than to tell the truth which I again believe in because being 100% yourself when people are looking sort of feels wrong and too vulnerable and like you're opening yourself up for real criticism and like it just isn't pretty or perfect enough to be viewed but a lot of the time what we actually applaud in others is realness. I'm also just a girl. And this goes both for actors and entertainers like that's why people flock to Emma Chamberlain or or what we often love about drama movies things that feel real chapter nine emotion memory <laughs> emotion memory is definitely on top of my list of chapters maybe even my favorite chapter towards says all external production is formal, cold, and pointless if it is not motivated from within. Again, this means that even if you had the perfect run in a play, you shouldn't just physically duplicate it. Because if you do that, it's no longer perfect, it's fake, it's inauthentic. However, what you should do is use the same emotional triggers that you used the first time, the second time. So you shouldn't remember like, what was I doing with my eyebrow? Did I flare my nostrils? That's hard to do. <laughs> but you should remember like what made me do that? What was I feeling? What was I thinking about that made me feel that way? What was I experiencing? What was it like? And sort of put yourself back there emotionally, but then also with the past because you have to draw on the same emotion memory, which you'll be getting to. And emotion memory is just think about something that was very um, impactful for you growing up like a heartbreak or a very romantic evening or like your pet dying or whatever it is something that was very very big and that can't be overlooked when looking back at your life and like a specific scene specific day and then think not about what you saw and what was spoken but exactly how you felt when that thing was happening and when you feel as though it is happening right now that is an emotional memory so to test your emotion memory, you can at any time just, you can just go back in the situation, view it in your mind, it's kind of like um, reverse visualization, and feel the feelings. And if you're feeling the feelings, and they feel really, really real, you got it down. But another thing that also helps to sort of shake up a performance and make it feel not stale, other than like emotional triggers and emotional memory, is throwing in new surprises. He shows this, for example, when they're all sick of the madman thing, he puts a twist, like, oh, the madman's already in the house, and they're like, oh, shit, he's in the house. You hear me? It's coming from inside the house. And, like, I remember I was doing this production of, what was I doing production of? Fantasia? I don't know. I was in some sort of theater production when I was a kid, and they shook it up by, like, we were eating this porridge, and it was supposed to taste like crap, and you're like, oh, I hate this porridge, but then they actually just literally... Instead of putting sugar on it, they put salt on it and it tasted like crap and uh, 
you can read on all the children's faces like this porch really sucks and it was unexpected too so you get a bigger reaction going back to motion memories you can definitely test them but you can also feel also likely experience them a lot just like for me personally and this is true for a lot of people when you hear a certain song you're all of a sudden like oh my god like you're not just remembering listening to your prom or whatever but she'll actually remember the feeling you're in the and that song can make you happy or sad or just wistful and you're like oh my god oh yeah that's right that song those feelings or just any unexpected thing and i think especially with grief we see this a lot for like random things so just remind us of a person and situation and just make us teary-eyed when for everyone around, there's nothing special happening with you. There's this one little thing like that color, that smell, or that thing you're seeing that just reminds you of the person makes you sad or happy. And the cool thing about emotional memories is that like I sort of said right now, they go hand in hand often with sensory memories, which means that it's a lot easier to trigger them than you think. You don't have to be a master of visualization to have an emotional memory. You can actually just put on a song or smell a smell or go into a certain room and you will probably feel the things you want to feel. And we use emotion memories because all of the emotions we're feeling are supposed to be real. And because of this, towards self sass, never lose yourself on stage. Always act in your own person as an artist. You can never get away from yourself. The moment you lose yourself on stage marks the departure from truly living your part in the beginning of exaggerated false acting. Always and forever when you're on stage, you must play yourself but it will be in an infinite variety of combinations of objectives and given circumstances which you have prepared for your part and which have been smelted in the furnace of your emotion memory. And when he's asked like, but how can I always do that? Like I won't have anything in common with all of these characters. He says, the roles for which you have the appropriate feelings are those you will never play well. They will be excluded from your repertoire, basically. And he says that like obviously we can make it easier for an actor to play truthfully with like good surroundings and stuff but we as an actor can't really do anything about that we're sort of in the hands of the director. And thinking about this I really do feel bad for like Ian McKellen and stuff who said he almost had a mental breakdown when playing in The Lord of the Rings because everything was CGI and he wasn't like talking to anyone and like I think CGI is really really cool but it's true like acting in a box isn't like even I get how it didn't feel like real acting because you're supposed to feel that connection to the person you're acting with and even the things around you so like even though in The Wizard of Oz the set isn't real it looks real it's painted like there's something tangible there but uh, in the new Spider-Man movie, like what is really around you, like what it, when you're looking at an object and it's not there, it's hard to like really look the way an actor should and especially your person. Then he also says that emotion memory doesn't have to be like, oh, someone did this to me and I felt like this, but it can even be just, I witnessed someone feeling like that. Like, for example, you know how secondhand embarrassment is a big thing, even when we're watching a movie. If you see someone get water thrown in their face and you feel secondhand embarrassment from that, what you have to do is sort of chance for that those feelings of secondhand embarrassment into firsthand embarrassment by like feeling the feelings you're feeling, but then putting yourself in that person's situation and then really feeling it from that perspective. And of course, as an actor, you must always at all times study people around you because we have to build out our repertoire. We can't just play ourselves in infinite versions, although some actors do seem to do that. We have to be able to understand all types of people so we have to study them and see the situations they're in and the emotions that come from that. Chapter 10, Communion. And chapter 10 is sort of what I was getting at with the CGI which is communion which goes beyond just looking at a person looking at an object and sort of really understanding their soul I guess. A lot of the time when we act, we're really focused on our own lines when we're gonna say and we sort of miss what the other person's saying or we just hear it but we're not hearing it. And that's wrong then we're acting falsely or we're not even acting at all because we're not supposed to be just listing things back and forth to each other we're supposed to be listening to what they're saying and then responding but you can only respond like truly respond if you're actually listening that's why people say acting is reacting dude what does mine say sweet what about mine dude so when we're listening to someone as an actor 
we have to hear them, truly hear them in the way we do in real life, which is as if we haven't heard it before. You know, like if someone's telling me a story, I'm not like sitting there listening to the story like, oh, okay, and then waiting for, well, what I think about this is because in real life, I don't know how the story ends yet. So I have to actually pay attention and to do that as an actor, you have to be genuinely interested in what they have to say and experience it as if it's the first time, even though you do actually know what they're going to say. But it gets deeper than that. If you don't just have communion, which is with another person or several persons, we also have self-communion. On screen and on stage, we talk to ourselves a lot more than we talk to ourselves in real life. Yes, it does, Other Barry. Oh, yes. Because we have to explain things to the audience. And when you're talking to yourself and listening to yourself, you have to actually understand yourself and commune with yourself. And so Tortsov says, choose one part of you as the speaker and one part of you as the listener. Like for example, speak with your brain and listen with your heart or vice versa, but you have to really understand yourself and be in communion with yourself. And since we're always listening to ourselves, reading ourselves, being true with ourselves, we are also, as have been mentioned many, many times, ourselves on stage. Stage. So, for example, when Margot Robbie plays Harley Quinn, obviously she's not Margot Robbie, but she isn't just Harley Quinn either. If she was Harley Quinn, she wouldn't be an actor, she wouldn't exist, you know, it's a whole thing. Instead, you can say that she's Margot Quinn or Harley Robbie or, you know, Robbie Quinn, whatever you want to call it. She's a hybrid. All actors are hybrids on stage because we always have to bring ourselves. We can't get away from ourselves, remember? So for the communion to be gold, one thing it says is like don't practice with an inanimate object when acting, which I think like is that getting ruined a little by everything being self-tapes now? Maybe because we're always looking at an inanimate object basically if we're looking at the camera. But he says don't like, for example, like Oh, hi, hi, how was your day? You know, don't pretend like this is a person because then when it is a person in front of you, you'll still be looking at it like an object instead of communing with it as a person. Like all bad habits that we have while training also go on to stage. And we also have to juggle because we're not just in self-communion, we're not just in communion with the other actors, we're also in communion with the audience, which is hard because like you remember, we're not supposed to act for the audience but we still are. We're going back and forth, like they are a resonance. They're like when you're singing and you need good acoustics, the audience is the acoustics. Are they sighing when they're supposed to? Are they laughing when they're supposed to? Are they crying? All of that is a part of what is happening. The reactions is a part of the play. It's a part of the whole experience, both for them and for you. It's supposed to be this back and forth but it's a very subtle back and forth and it's one you obviously enjoy but even though you're supposed to take it to you and be like yes you're not supposed to do anything with it you're just supposed to inflict upon them and feel it and be in communion with them but not act for that purpose again he does warn us here too he's like don't be an exhibitionist you're not supposed to act for the reactions like obviously reactions are a good gauge of how you're acting and stuff but if something you're doing is making people laugh instead of making them sad when you're you actually want them to be sad don't continue with the laugh factor just continue the way you're supposed to do it and not just that but don't be a show off you know don't be like oh i'm going to show this huge range or i'm going to show how pretty i am you think i'm pretty the role isn't there for you, you are there for the role. Chapter 11, Adaptation. This is basically just adjusting ourselves to the circumstances and being dynamic. Again, not adapting for stage, even though it is very natural and very easy to fall into that, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to act to the given circumstances of the story. Again, here he says we have to learn to relax, then we'll be a lot more creative and again, adaptive. And we can sort of adapt on purpose and give, give ourselves uh, these surprises and depths that make us better actors, more engaged. For example, instead of things just being tragic, being like so tragic that it's almost funny, like we have this ironic distance to it, but it has to read as true, it has to be true. 
and things adapting and things changing also we should welcome and like the character changing to the circumstances is good for example for someone to be very sad over heartbreak it makes sense that they were first very happy and in love and the tragicness comes from losing that if they weren't in the first place then it would be like okay who cares <laughs> chapter 12 inner motive forces in this chapter, I pick out a quote. Actors whose feelings overbalance their intellects will naturally, in playing Romeo or Othello... Backstabber. I'm surprised you've read Othello. What the hell's Othello? I'm calling you the parrot from Aladdin. Emphasize the emotional side. Actors in whom will is the most powerful attribute will play Macbeth or Brand and underscore ambition or fanaticism. The third type will unconsciously stress, more than is necessary, the intellectual shadings of a part like Hamlet or Nathan Device. It is, however, necessary not to allow any one of those three elements to crush out either of the others and thereby upset the balance and necessary harmony. Our art recognizes all three types and in their creative work, all three forces play leading parts. The only type that we reject is too cold and reasoning is that which is born of arid calculation. Chapter 13, The Unbroken Line. The unbroken line is sort of a continuation of the units and objects that we talked about earlier. He says that a role must have a continuous and unbroken line. You know, if you have the units, you also have to have a story that they all fit into. But what is interesting here and that I appreciate more is that he also talks about how we as an actor sort of have to imagine and understand like what happened before the play and what will likely happen after the play and what happens when our character is off screen because all of this influences the character just as much, if not even more, than what is actually happening on stage. And to sort of train this line of thinking, he makes his student think back from the moment right now until he woke up in the day, and then the other way again, like to learn this unbroken line until he actually knows by heart. Like, I woke up in our day and age, I'd say I woke up, I looked at my phone for a while, scrolled the different apps, then got up, brushed my teeth, etc. You know, walk the dog. In the morning, if my face is a little puffy, I'll put on an ice pack while doing my stomach crunches. Learning to look at the day is an unbroken line. You can do this with a long enough, as long as a period as you want, but um, that's the trick. I think a lot of the times when we view shows and movies, it's kind of failed and like, weird not interesting is when the different parts don't align and towards self says an actor's attention is constantly passing from one object to another it is that constant change of foci that constitutes the unbroken line if an actor should cling to one object during the whole act or the whole play he would be spiritually unbalanced and the victim of an idea fix that's what i was trying to say earlier that like being sad first and then being happy and then being happy and then being sad actually makes the story flow better than just one thing because that's just frankly weird. In life, things do fluctuate all the time and that is natural. Chapter 14, The Inner Creative State. Chapter 14, The Inner Creative State, I take as like a combination of all these different things we've learned and basically it's how you have to be in the right state of mind to portray things rightly on stage. So like you have to have the emotion memory down, you have to have your objectives, you have to relax your body and you just can't be fake. So all of these things have to come and work together to create the ideal creative state so that you can be natural and not be fake. Chapter 15, the super objective. Even though I've complained a little bit about units and objectives, I love the idea of the super objective. And it made a lot of things make a lot more sense for me, is what I'm gonna say. So the super objective is like an objective, but it's for the whole production, what the whole story is about for your character. What is the number one thing that they wanna do, that they wanna achieve, that they care about and are carrying throughout this whole thing, and that is underlying every single interaction and moment they have on stage or on screen. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Here also the name of the objective is even more important with the super objective than the objective themselves. For example, I wrote out this super objective that I imagined for Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey. Yes, yeah, so I'm going hard for Margot Robbie and Harley Quinn, but that's that's my thing, you know. I wrote, I wish to be independent and inspire fair in my own right with a moral that matches the real me. And I think that fits. If 
Felix throughout it, it's, it's a wish. You know, like sometimes the moral doesn't match or sometimes the moral is flawed and sometimes the moral is flawed because her moral, her real me is a bit flawed. But throughout it, you see a wish to be independent, a wish to inspire fear. But I'm the one they should be scared of. Not you, not Mr. J. And a wish to actually be a better person and be closer to the person she always thought she was before the Joker. Having that one super objective that runs throughout the whole movie makes the movie more streamlined as well. And Tortsov says that like, hey, even if the script is bad, even if the production is bad, you can still have a very good super objective that makes your acting good, but it does have to match the character. It can't be something you completely made up and it can't go against the character, but you have to find whatever is good, whatever makes sense, whatever is true, and cling to that super objective for bare life. And throughout the whole thing, everything must point to the super objective, obviously. Chapter 16, On the Threshold of the Subconscious. This is sort of a summation. It tells us that like, hey, like we've been saying, the goal of the system is to inspire the subconscious, to engage it. And it is the engagement of the subconscious that it's the goal, not the system itself, not just following a system. We are following the system for a reason, or if you will, with purpose. And we cannot control the subconscious, but we can coax it. And here again, it's like, it's about imagination and putting little challenges for yourself that makes you more creative and whatever you can do to engage yourself using the system and just continuing to add layers. Like, okay, what if she's thinking this? What if she's feeling this? And what if this happened before and then that happens and then she remembered this? All while following your lines, seeing what she's supposed to do, but adding layers, adding emotions and just getting that right performance. For example, I was imagining this with one of the most hilarious scenes. I know if you've seen, you probably have, a bridesmaid with Kristen Wiig and you've definitely seen on TikTok the sound where she's like, and you're a little C word, you know, where she goes overboard in the interaction with the girl. God, I feel bad for your parents. I feel bad for your face. Okay, well, call me when your boobs come in. And I was thinking, what if all throughout this whole thing where she's like, oh, you think love is all that and friendship is all that, but just wait, if she's thinking like, this friendship was like the last thing I had and I truly love her. And one thing is that she's getting married, but now she's choosing yet another person over me, a person who already has everything. And I'm working in this dumb store to sell dumb things to dumb teenagers. She doesn't get it and no one gets it. And I just miss my friend, I miss my bakery and I miss actually having a future. And all of that comes out is, and you're a little C word. <laughs> There's a lot under the surface. It's like the, the iceberg metaphor, which I know has been beat to death, but still iceberg metaphor. This is what she's saying. And all of this is what she's feeling. We see all of this throughout the movie, but if we can take all of those sad things we see in this comedy movie and put it into the minds of the person in the movie, it makes it a lot easier for the actors to truly come up with the right outburst. And again, like I said, Changes in moods are not like wavering, they're not abandoning the character, they're actually natural, they're actually living with the character. And lots of different moods fit within the super objective. Even just looking at like how am I doing with my super objective can say a lot about the mood. Review. So I really, really enjoyed this book. I thought it was really fun. I thought it was interesting to see how some parts are dated and even more interesting to see how so many of them just are forever truths that like everyone says influence everything we're still watching and just Konstantin Stanislavski is a genius because he wrote things that truly stand the test of time and just he discovered the truth about acting, I guess. I guess that there are some parts that I personally find a little bit boring. I would definitely take the more, for me personally, boring parts with the whole bunch. And I think that the parts that maybe don't inspire me, inspire other people, vice versa, it's already dependent on who you are. And that's probably why there are so many different methods as well within this one system, because we're not all triggered by the same thing, but as long as we're triggered. <laughs> So in conclusion, I do think this is a book that every actor needs to have on their shelf. If you're just getting into acting, this is the first book you should definitely pick up and spend your money on. It is well, well worth it. And for every actor, you can also reread until the end of time and discover new things because it's just filled with inspiration and methods and 
Also good characters. I honestly at first thought that maybe it was real and that this was like Kostya's diary and I was like wow okay so he's just delivering the business of all of these people and then I realized like oh shit this is actually Socratic and it was still as good and I still cared about the drama. The end.